Hello, my name is Peter Houston, and I'm the Archivist uh, and Special Collections Librarian at Mount Royal University. And today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about some of the Reformation texts that we have uh, in our archives and special collections. So we have a nice little collection of about 50 uh, leaves, so individual kind of pages, from medieval and early modern manuscripts. So I've got a couple up on, sc up on screen here. And uh, these are liturgical texts uh, from the medieval church, so the pre-Reformation church, um, before yeah, before it began to splinter. Um, these are yeah, liturgical texts, so they relate to public worship. Um, these would have been intended for use by the clergy, by priests, monks, and nuns in the uh, what was known as the liturgy of the hours, uh, sort of the daily round of of worship of you know, prayer, reflection, um, that, uh, that would have taken place, say, in the monasteries. Um, so on the left, we have a, a leaf from, a leaf from a breviary, um, a book, uh, that, that would have contained all the prayers and readings, uh, to be, to be said. And on the right is a leaf from a choir book, uh, from Spain from the 16th, yeah, late, <laughs> mid 16th century, um, with, uh, Gregorian chant. So, um, th these are just examples of, of yeah, some of the types of books um, that would have been produced before um, the Reformation. Uh, again, for use by the church, you can see they're, they're written in Latin, um, the language of the church. Uh, only, only you know, those with sufficient learning would have been able to use them. Um, and they would have been created by, by scribes. So before the printing press uh, arrived in the mid-15th century in, in Europe, um, uh, scribes like this would have written entire books out by using quill pens, and you can imagine how sort of laborious and time-consuming a process this would have been. This all changed, though, with the advent of, of European printing, uh, with Johannes Gutenberg in the city of Mainz and the Holy Roman Empire in, in the 1450s. He sort of pioneered this, this new uh, printing system um, by which books could be printen, printed uh, 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 accurately uh, and and way more cheaply and quickly than than could ever have been done by hand, and this had huge huge effects, um, and and had a great effect especially on the Reformation, um, since uh, this uh, this technology was available to the reformers, um, they were able to use it to quickly disseminate their ideas, their criticisms of the church, their sort of uh, theological. Um, uh, ideas and concepts uh, quickly by printing off um, sort of cheaply mass-produced pamphlets uh, that could then be distributed widely, spreading their ideas in a way that wasn't possible back in the days of, of uh, you know, scribes writing things out by hand as manuscripts. So really one of the, the ways to understand the success of the Reformation is, is uh, you know, through the, the technology that it relied on. So. And I've got a number of examples from our holdings of, of printed texts uh, from that period. So this one comes from uh, sort of newly Protestant England. Uh, Henry VIII, of course, broke with the, with the Church of Rome, broke with the papacy over uh, his, his desire for, for a divorce um, uh, so that he could marry Anne Boleyn. Uh, and so yeah, that break, of course, was in 1533. Six years later, this, this book uh, was produced. This is the Great Bible, the first authorized English translation of the Bible, uh, which Henry VIII uh, made all the, the churches throughout his kingdom uh, purchase a copy of this so that um, you know, preachers could use it in their preaching, but also a provision was made so that every, uh, every parishioner had a right to come up and read the, the word of God themselves in English, their own language. Um, so you can see here, if we, if we look a little closer, uh, it is it is readable uh, even now, even though the language is a bit archaic. And this was a pretty revolutionary idea, and and it sort of enabled that Protestant desire for um, ordinary people uh, to be able to have this direct relationship uh, with God. No longer would they have to be reliant on a you know a priest to translate things from Latin. Uh, they they could they could have that that direct relationship directly with the divine. So quite a break. 
This uh, comes from sort of the other camp. Here is a book of hours, a very Catholic book of hours, um, published uh, around 1522 in Paris. Uh, it is it is quite quite a beautiful book. You can see a lot of illustrations here in bright colors. Uh, someone must have paid a bit extra to have what would have been um, metal cut illustrations overpainted to make them look like these beautiful um, miniature paintings. And, and basically what the Book of Hours was, was it was a, an exceedingly popular um, sort of devotional book for lay people, for not for, for um, you know, for clerical use, uh, like the, the manuscripts we saw earlier, but this was meant for sort of personal devotion. Um, so, and the, as I was saying, this, this book was, was extremely popular. Uh, an, an incredible number of these have actually survived uh, since since uh, medieval times, um, because they were produced in such great numbers before every family had a Bible, every family, well, every family that was wealthy and literate um, would, would have a book of hours. This would be the one book in your house if you were actually able to own a book and read it yourself. Um, this one though is, is in Latin, still sticking with, uh, I mean, this is a sort of from, coming from that traditional um, Catholic uh, uh, church, even though it's not, not produced by the church uh, directly, but but still following along very much with, with sort of their traditional doctrine. So everything is, is in Latin. Um, you can see too, even from the illustrations here, there is a strong emphasis on, on Mary and the saints. Uh, the heart of the Book of Hours was, was known as the Little Office of the Blessed Virgin. It was modeled on that Liturgy of the Hours that I talked about earlier, that the round of prayers and, and devotion um, that, that, you know, say was practiced in the monasteries, this gave ordinary people the chance to participate in, in that kind of devotional activity themselves, but in the quiet of their own homes, um, by reading out of this book at certain times of the day. And a lot of it was, the hours of the Virgin, of course, were, were sort of devoted to Mary herself, who was seen as the primary kind of intercessor, uh, who could, you know, plead your case uh, on to, to Jesus, her son, uh, directly. Similar thing with the saints. Here we have on the right a picture of Saint Sebastian being martyred uh, with arrows, um, and there's a number of these uh, suffrages or kind of short prayers to the saints, again asking for them to intercede on your behalf. Uh, Saint Sebastian himself was, was uh, known for being particularly efficacious as an intercessor for the plague-stricken. Um, Moving along to another item that we have in our collection is, this is the Book of Christian Prayer, published about 70 years later after the Book of Hours. Uh, this one from, from England, from sort of newly Protestant England, and it is it's similar in some ways to the Book of, Book of Hours in that it's meant to be sort of a popular work of devotion, um, usable by, by anyone, um, not, not meant for kind of uh, clerical use. Um, but it has a lot of big differences. For one thing, you'll see Mary and the saints are basically entirely absent uh, from this. No longer are you relying on them to intercede on your behalf with God. Uh, all the prayers in this are addressed to God directly. So you can see you can see that even in the text here. You know, they start off with uh, merciful Jesus Christ or, or grant Lord that blah, blah, blah. Um, Again, this kind of Protestant belief that uh, um, anyone can have a sort of direct relationship with God. Um, and uh, some other things to note, the amazing uh, woodcut uh, uh, illustrated borders around this. Here showing the dance of death, showing different members of, of sort of Elizabethan society, the rich man, the young woman, the damsel, everyone being led off by the Grim Reaper. It's supposed to be a memento mori, sort of a reminder of death that, uh, you know, no matter who you are, we're all fated to die, so put your trust in, in, in uh, God uh, and pray for salvation. I think this book is really interesting too because it speaks to some of the fears and sort of social tensions of the time. So on the, the page on your left, you can see uh, references to uh, the Turk with his sword. So of course, Europe uh, was, was, had been sort of periodically invaded in the 16th century uh, by Ottoman armies, um, which caused a lot of consternation in the Catholic West. And uh, you can also see a lot of references to, to the Pope and to Papists. Um, so it says, 
the Bishop of Rome, aka the Pope, um, on the other side, uh, compared to the Turk, is more fierce and bitter against us, stirring up his bishops to burn us, his confederates to conspire our destruction. Um, so again, just I think really speaks to the you know the the very strong tensions of the time you know when um, Europe was divided you know no longer a unified Christendom but broken into sort of Catholic and Protestant nations at war with one another with a lot of persecution going on um, against adherents of both sides so an interesting kind of social document too uh, here on I just included this one on the right because I saw there was a prayer to be said in the plague time obviously early modern peoples were, were also worried about sickness and disease, uh, as we are today, unfortunately, in the pandemic. Uh, now, texts in the Reformation, a lot of texts were altered uh, or outright destroyed, um, and this, this uh, is a good example of that. So we have, I believe, seven leaves from a 1522 edition of, uh, in English, of the Golden Legend, which was a very popular medieval collection of saints' lives, hagiographies. Um, but these ones, the, the leaves that we have from this, we don't have the complete work, uh, are interesting because they've been censored. So this one, you can see the image of, of this guy here, St. Aldelm the Bishop, an Anglo-Saxon saint, has been uh, disfigured with ink. I'm thinking perhaps because he looks kind of like the Pope with his, his mitre and his bishop's robes. And also underneath that, every time that the, the word Pope uh, comes up, it's been crossed out by someone. Uh, similar to uh, the whole section about St. Thomas of Canterbury, who Henry VIII uh, sort of despised and, and suppressed his cult um, and his pilgrimage site because he had been such a staunch defender of papal supremacy. Um, that entire section has been crossed out. Though I almost wonder, I, I would think, I don't know, it makes me wonder who did this and why they did it, um, because you can still read it. So I'm not sure if this is a, you know, a very zealous Protestant reader um, that's taken upon himself to censor the text, or whether it's someone, maybe a crypto-Catholic, someone who secretly is holding on to their Catholic faith, who's decided, uh, you know, I'd better cross this out because if anyone were to find this book and see St. Thomas and all these other saints honored and, you know, the Pope's name all over the place, I could get into big trouble because people were being, um, in some cases, even burned at the stake for having Catholic texts in, you know, Elizabeth's Protestant England. So they've crossed it off to keep themselves safe in case of discovery, but they haven't done it in, or they've done it in a half-hearted way that allows them to still read it. I'm not sure which reading is correct, but anyways, a super interesting uh, text regardless. So those are just a few of the texts that we have uh, in, in our archives and special collections, um, ones specifically relating to the Reformation. Uh, if you want to take a look at, at anything else, you can go to our archive search database at archives.mtrl.ca. Here's a screenshot of it. You can search for the early print collection and the medieval and early modern manuscript collection. And uh, a lot of them have been digitized. Some of them haven't, but you can always get in touch with me. I've got my email up there. And yeah, ordinarily you could come in and take a look at any of these in person. But uh, for now, we might just have to scan things and send them to you. Um, anyways, please, uh, please get in contact if you're interested, and I hope this has been illuminating for you, not just to kind of show you what we have, uh, relating to the Reformation, but maybe, uh, maybe we'll spark uh, a visit to the archives. There's lots of other archives that have really fantastic, uh, Reformation, uh, collections. So, thanks very much for watching.